Okay, hello, I'm Alexander Karp, a professor at Program in Mathematics at Teachers College, Columbia University. And I'm going to introduce our book on the Eastern European Mathematics Education in the Decade of Change, as the book is called. And the book will hopefully be published uh, by the end of the academic year. Uh, that is uh, in the spring or early summer by spring. Uh, the book is uh, going to be published in the series which uh, Gert Schubrink and myself uh, are editing, the series uh, on the history of uh, mathematics teaching and uh, mathematics. And probably the first thing which I need to do is to say a few words about the series in general, and then go to the specifics of the book. Uh, I need to do it probably, first of all, because many people uh, generally do not quite believe uh, that something is changing in uh, the mathematics education. So what can change here? Uh, quadratic equations are still quadratic equations, and uh, sine is a sine, uh, and uh, Pythagorean theorem is still there. So, so uh, why we are talking about the history here? Uh, in reality, it's completely wrong. A lot of things, of course, is changing in mathematics education uh, from different perspectives, and that's in some specific we'll later discuss. Uh, one more opinion, uh, broadly, is that we need to study uh, history because um, formally things were good and now they are not good. And we need to learn uh, from the past directly, take something from there. Uh, we'll later, I believe, talk, we'll talk about uh, conservative ideal which exists in education. First of all, let's not change anything, and then everybody will be happy. Uh, and uh, that's not true either. And we cannot um, simply, you see, things, education in particular, uh, exists in some specific of life. It's connected with the life. And uh, it's very naive to believe that we can simply take some great things, even great things from uh, existing 200 years ago, and we'll take them. People very often like this opinion. Uh, with every reform I uh, remember uh, in Russia, where I'm from, uh, that when there was a major reform uh, so-called Kolmogorov reform, and a uh, new textbook uh, appeared, and uh, people like to describe that, oh, my son does not understand anything, but uh, one day we were uh, in summer in my mother or grandmother a cottage house, and somewhere there found old textbook, and it was so beautifully written that he understood immediately everything. <clears throat> uh, basically, no. He probably he didn't understand in reality, or if he did understand, not, not what he had to understand. So it's not the reason. But what is the reason? The reason is that history is a kind of a memory. And we need to have a memory. We need to remember what was going on, how things were changing, what were the processes, what were the problems. It doesn't mean that we'll find direct answer immediately, but that's our school of understanding things. And without this understanding of the past, we cannot understand the present. Uh, so, uh, that's why we need to understand these things in mathematics education. But there is another side, you know, we want to understand uh, our life in general, not just mathematics education, but history, the relations uh, in our life. And uh, mathematics education, as every education, every kind of education, is a side, is an aspect of this life. And so, uh, uh, probably surprisingly for somebody, but if we want to understand better how 
people leave at some moment, we need to not only explore which decisions this or that king or president did, but also how people lived in all uh, settings, including including education, including mathematics education. So, so we are in this series uh, trying to serve different categories of readers, and uh, that's why uh, we arranged this series. Thank you to Springer for uh, publishing it. So we so far published three books, and the first one is a book of, I will probably show it, the book of Gert Schubring, edited by Gert Schubring. It's about interfaces between mathematics education yeah, mathematical practices and mathematics education. Second book, uh, edited by myself, was uh, one uh, international commission in mathematical instruction, which was created in 1908. Uh, happy to say it was an in initiative of David Eugene Smith, who was a director of the uh, program here at Teachers College, he suggested to create an international commission which will explore uh, mathematics education all over the world. It was more than 100 years ago, 1908. And then there were national subcommissions in different places, including, say, Russian Empire, and uh, which tried to collect data uh, on education. And third book was more mathematical books, book on uh, the development of descriptive geometry by three authors, Evelyn Barbin, Martin Mengini, and Klaus Volker. They edited the book. They are main authors. Now, the fourth book, and now we are at last coming to the main point, <clears throat> is on uh, the changes in the Eastern European uh, mathematical education. Uh, and here there are several things which we need to say from the very beginning. Here is a very interesting situation that uh, Eastern Europe was by, uh, let's call it explicitly, occupied by Soviet Union. And uh, basically it uh, had, uh, was closed. We know iron certainly it was um, basically not connected in many ways with the other world. And at the same time, uh, we need to say that the reputation of mathematics education in this country was very high. And uh, people sometimes said, not all people not always understood what are the reasons, how the system works, uh, what was uh, wrong there, what was good there. But the result that in uh, Moscow, uh, Novosibirsk, St. Petersburg, Kiev, um, <clears throat> uh, Warsaw, um, you can, of course, Budapest, you can, many, many other uh, places there were fantastic schools of mathematics, and they somehow were created. It was uh, basically uh, understood, and this uh, was highly respected. And there was, you can find some books under the title Socialist Mathematics. Uh, again, you can challenge the title because uh, was it really socialist? Was it not? It's another story. But uh, the point is that it was highly respected. And when in, uh, let's say, after the collapse of Soviet Union, after the collapse of Warsaw Treaty, when the doors somewhat opened and these mathematical people went to the West and to the East actually, but mainly to the West, it was a, a really a great thing and one important French mathematician uh, representing the famous group, the last, last generation of so-called Bourbaki uh, group, he once even said a fantastic sentence. He said, 
what Stalin failed to do with all his tanks, Soviet and I would add Eastern European mathematics did. They conquered the world. <coughs> and indeed, if you even today, <coughs> excuse me, even today you come to the good mathematical uh, university, a uh, good um, de mathematical department in the university, you will find there many uh, representatives of these, let's say, Eastern European uh, mathematics. Russian, Ukrainian, Hungarian, uh, Polish, uh, and so on, Bulgarian, uh, and so on, and so forth. <clears throat> and an interesting thing simultaneously, with all this respect, People were not that interested in studying mathematics education in these countries. Uh, a little bit strange situation, we deeply respect, but we are not interested. Meantime, 30 years passed. And we decided and we thought that we need, well, of course, I am exaggerating and say nobody studied. Of course, people studied. It's, let's be honest about it. I'm happy to praise our book, but there were some attempts at that. Let's say not sufficiently studied. And we decided to prepare a book on the changes in mathematics education, what has happened and how things change. And that's again very interesting and important from the point of view which I tried to uh, introduce understanding mathematics education as a part of social changes. Obviously, obviously, it's not a direct thing. It's not that anybody is going with uh, banners, uh, uh, more hours for trigonometric equations. No, never like that. But of course, of course, uh, things are connected and with what is happening in many ways. One thing which uh, we need to say at the very beginning, one thing which obviously influenced uh, basically all countries uh, of this former Soviet system, uh, there were economical uh, changes and uh, economical losses. Uh, obviously, with reforms, um, economical position, from, for example, of uh, many teachers clearly went down. A uh, teacher who was a well, not wealthy, nobody in some cell, almost nobody in Soviet Union was wealthy in, let's say, Western sense, but uh, but uh, teacher were well, well-established people and position went down, which necessarily influenced uh, the system. Another thing, for example, is that a lot of people immigrated. People count uh, these uh, things differently, and some people count, say, that about 20 million people immigrated from Soviet Union. It's different ways to count, uh, but look, and these people were well-educated people who were influenced in the school as parents, sometimes as teachers, as people who support in different ways. And they are not there, so of course it's third thing and influence negatively. Third thing which you immediately uh, see is that uh, there are other things became, uh, let's say, sometimes really allowed, sometimes somewhat allowed. But in Soviet Union, it was absolutely clear that uh, mathematics is in a better position than, say, history. Because history was highly ideological, and history, you automatically had to say something uh, that you are following the decision of our dear Communist Party. Uh, while in mathematics, uh, no, it was uh, somewhat protected. Uh, and now, so people, very many uh, people wanted to go in mathematics rather than 
in something else. And then the system changed, and many people, talented people, preferred to go in economics, in, uh, say, uh, business, in uh, to become lawyers, and so on. So these things also influence mathematics education, uh, and not necessarily positively, let's say like that. Now, a little bit about the book. So what is in the book? So I already started talking about the book, but how it's organized. So there are uh, seven chapters. <clears throat> and uh, introduction, there, there are chapters on Czech Republic, on uh, Poland, on, I um, list them as I remember, so they come now to my mind, uh, not they are listed in alphabetical order there. So, so again, Czech Republic, Poland, Hungary, um, uh, Hungary, uh, Russia, Ukraine. Uh, am I missing something? Let me double check, otherwise it's not okay so sorry i will start over here okay of course eastern germany so so again now i'm listing uh, the chapters in the order so czech republic uh eastern germany hungary uh poland russia ukraine six chapters and the seventh one is uh, a conclusion where i tried to explore the processes in general and try to somewhat generalize what was going on in these 30 years. So, what was going on? I said already about some negative things. <laughs> One more negative thing which I need now to mention from the position of a researcher. Very often we have no information. Uh, many things were not documented. We can say that, uh, you said, what can, should be documented? Well, you see how people' opinions change, for example. They are, should be a sociological service. They were not done, typically. Uh, how people, what was happening in the real classroom? And today, researchers in mathematics education <laughs> distinguish very clearly between so-called intended curriculum, that is what people want to do in the classroom. <laughs> and basic curriculum was implemented, what really happened in the classroom. That's not necessarily the same thing. Uh, and very often it's a problem to uh, ask, so what was there? What really happened? Oh, of course, you see, we all, you see, we can easily find those who studied in uh, Soviet school, like myself, uh, basically those who studied in any school, including Canadian or uh, American, they can find that there was some plan to study, and that's not necessarily happened for different reasons. So what was really happening in, in the school? What changed? We not always have it. There are many other things. So, one conclusion which we are making probably 10 times uh, is that we need to study, we need to learn more, we need to collect more data. But still with the data which we have, we can uh, make some statements and some conclusions. So, one thing which I would probably start with is, of course, a change of rhetoric everywhere in all these countries. By the way, all these countries, they have different different situations and you cannot, uh, we of course understand that Eastern Germany became part of United Germany and that was one story, while Ukraine uh, had a very dramatic history in these years with war, with uh, basically this, in reality, kinds of revolutions. Um, so, of course, there were, uh, diff it's a different, uh, they're in different situations. But, change of rhetoric. Let me cite, uh, it's in Ukrainian chapter, my Ukrainian colleagues who wrote it, and I need to say it's 
sorry for not saying it earlier, uh, I'm editor of the book, but we got authors from all of these countries. And they are teams of authors, uh, basically researchers in uh, mathematics education and practitioners in mathematics education uh, who uh, basically wrote about uh, their understanding of what was happening. So, citing uh, my Ukrainian colleagues, uh, they write in their chapter that the main goal of Soviet school was to form a comprehensively developed ideologically committed personality capable of actively participating in the renewal of communist society. That was the goal as stated in Soviet official documents. I wanted to read it because I myself am not able to translate this so beautifully in English. They, they uh, basically represented all this uh, language which was there. Uh, so when you think, okay, what does it mean? What it actually means for teaching of mathematics? Ideology. Well, here is an interesting thing that differently, I would say, from all other subjects. <laughs> mathematics, I would not say that it was not uh, that it was uh, ideologically free, of course not. But it was probably less corrupted in all Soviet educational system than any other subject. <clears throat> uh, nobody even speaks about history. Uh, but even in uh, physics, uh, they, or not to say biology, they brought a little bit of, uh, let's say, this bright uh, Soviet understanding. In mathematics, they deeply respect mathematics and they truly believe, I mean Soviet leaders, they truly believe that mathematics is necessary for military purposes. <laughs> it's by the way general belief uh, mathematics yet in Tsarist Russia was understood as a military subject. And so you should be very accurate. We are doing what we need to do, we are teaching mathematics. <clears throat> but, okay, what, what does it mean all these things? We need to prepare uh, people who will be able to work. So that stands, that in practice it means, okay, here we have some syllabus and student is supposed to learn it. Here is a textbook, you're supposed to know what is there. Now, we all understand that uh, not everybody is doing this, so we basically, we are interested, let's say very clearly, uh, we basically, a Soviet system, wanted to prepare good military engineers. Uh, it, never, it never was written explicitly, but basically, okay, and people connected with this. If you need military engineers, you need, of course, research mathematicians, uh, you need uh, research physicists, and so on and so forth. So you need to have people who will learn this. Okay, and after whatever you select as a uh, date, 1991, collapse of Soviet Union, or 88, 89, uh, Velvet revolutions and so on, uh, but uh, clearly language changed. Now we all speak about uh, individual, uh, individual approach, development of personality, um, assisting in uh, developing all abilities, um, preparing language came with competences that we need to give competences to live in the uh, world, and so on and so forth. Uh, I would say that, of course, this new rhetoric <laughs> is much better. The point is that uh, what should be done in practice is not always that clear. And how should we, 
what you practically should do to assist people, students to develop their potential. And I would say that in, I wouldn't say all situations, but in many situations, in many countries, uh, the result was, let's say, very strong stratification. Good received more opportunities to be good, but bad received more opportunities to be bad. And those uh, interested in mathematics, more attention was probably, more opportunities uh, were permitted for them. I will talk about this in a moment. While those are not interested, okay, so they are not interested, we deeply respect. We, you are not interested, we are not caring. Uh, is it sounds democratic, but it's not because and some people were cited in the book, some people at the very beginning said, wait, but if a 10 year old boy or girl say, uh, I'm not interested in mathematics, and you say, yes, we do not touch, we do not try to change, we respect. But that means that in three or four years, the student will not be able he will or she will change her opinion. But no, that's it. You can't change it because it's a systematic thing. Uh, so to what extent in reality it was always, uh, let's say, democratic, I would not say that it's a clear answer. Here. One more thing which is clearly should be discussed because it's a very important situation that many, say, many uh, places, uh, particularly parts of Soviet Union, it was very important to create their own, uh, let's say, standards, materials, and so on. <laughs> say, in Ukraine, uh, of course, and unfortunately, I wanted to have more chapters from former Soviet Union, but we have only Russia and Ukraine, but however, the largest parts. Uh, Ukrainian uh, materials, Ukrainian documents from Soviet Union period basically copied, well, to some extent, with some details, uh, Ministry of Soviet Union materials. So where, let's say, generally speaking, it was Soviet Union materials. Uh, with all excuses, with all reservations. Now, the task came after Ukraine became independent to create its own materials, its own standards, uh, and things like that. Well, with textbooks, it was, was somewhat probably, well, it's an, also a problem, but somewhat easier because uh, there were Ukrainian textbooks, some of Ukrainian textbooks were Soviet Union textbooks, like textbook in geometry of Pogorelov. But, uh, but generally there were there was a task to create national materials. One more thing which is very important and came as a problem in all countries, not only parts of former Soviet Union, was a system of assessment. Soviet system of assessment, and let's be honest, uh, more or less the same in all these former socialist countries, uh, Soviet system in general uh, doesn't want honest assessment. Uh, all Soviet exams, it was a system uh, in which you know in, in advance what kind of result you, you need to collect. So, okay, let's try to, now when we have more democratic approach, less rigid system, uh, and that was a claim, uh, Let's have more uh, honest and fair system of assessment, specifically system of final or exit uh, exams in the high school. And in chapters, in all chapters, there are uh, something on this, but uh, particularly Russian and Ukrainian chapters have a lot of materials about uh, these things because system of national exams uh, basically came into the life. And uh, with 
positive and negative systems, so I am not given, you see, it's a sophisticated issue, not that I should end with given a grade, uh, but uh, it's, of course, has pros and cons. Uh, and one clear, one positive thing is that at least we have a little bit more information about what is happening in reality how many students do not learn the current course of mathematics. Uh, and uh, results, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean how many students fail, because system is arranged in such a way that uh, passing grade is done pretty low and people can uh, pass uh, even with very limited knowledge. But so who has limited knowledge? Well, in reality, very many people, I would say, it will not be a mistake to say that we clearly can say that about half of student population receive very, very limited mathematical education. Probably, I, I'm very modest in my estimation. That's a good thing that we know the truth. But although, again, it's limited, clearly we discussed it with my Ukrainian colleagues that, of course, in Ukraine, you can get much more information than in Russia. But even in Russia, you basically, if you want to get something, you'll get something. Uh, what is a negative thing, that exam automatically, things which in American, and I'm sure in Canadian uh, literature is uh, widely discussed, that once you have high stakes tests, <laughs> People automatically study for them. And once you say, aha, your goal is to pass an exam, then people care about the exam, not about some philosophical things and understanding what mathematics is all about. And that's why these things are broadly discussed in the society. And here I'm just introducing one more topic uh, how society think about these things. In society, there is a lot of negative comments, and they are, for example, again, my Ukrainian colleagues told me uh, that uh, there is a system where you can uh, file a petition to cancel this exam, and a lot of people already signed a petition to, to cancel this. One more thing, which I believe, again, is the process is happening similar in different countries, is uh, about gifted education. And let's be honest, gifted education, I don't like this language. Basically, I don't like this word gifted, because who knows who is gifted. But I like those interested in uh, studying mathematics. By the way, in Soviet Union, the language which was used was uh, schools with an advanced course of study in mathematics. So nobody said that students doing it are gifted. They just selected more advanced school. And here is the thing that particularly in Russia, a lot of things is now uh, said in support of this gifted education. Look, uh, say in 70s, in 1970s, in the city of St. Petersburg, where I'm from, uh, there was one gentleman who was in charge of the system of education, and he said that these schools with an advanced course of study is like a cancer on the healthy body of Soviet school. Because for us, Soviet people, having this school with advanced teaching, it's not what we need. We are a socialist country. We need to have everybody at the same level, and so on and so forth. Completely different now. Everybody supports gifted education. Everybody says, oh, please. It goes sometimes in a bit funny way for me, because, say, <laughs> Uh, Mr. Putin, uh, president of Russia, promised, it's true, it's just uh, uh, everywhere, he promised to give, I don't remember, a million of rubles or two millions of rubles to every boy or girl who wins 
Olympiads, international Olympiads in mathematics. Guys, Olympiads, it's not a way to earn money. It's for those interested. It's, uh, it's completely, you bring uh, wrong things into, uh, <laughs> into this uh, game. But the point is that now we see that gifted education, if you are using this language, is deeply connected with general education. General education, and as I said, there is the process as some uh, generally, very many students do not receive sufficiently good education now. And once they do not receive education, they cannot say, oh, I love mathematics. By the way, similar process happens, say, in the United States. I cannot miss saying this, not an expert in Canada. <coughs> but you see, we are losing a lot of talented and interested people because they are taught mathematics in such a nasty way that they simply do not understand that it's an interesting thing to study. Course curriculum is terrible, teachers are terrible, uh, mathematics is terrible, they all know. And uh, probably if it were done better, probably they would develop this interest, probably they will uh, become uh, mathematicians. We don't know, it's a, it's a much more sophisticated process. So, so it's a controversial process with uh, this gifted education too. Uh, complete change in rhetoric, but um, controversial process in reality. One more thing which I would uh, like to mention, and probably I need to finalize, is changes in teacher education. And I personally believe that the major thing is teacher education. If you prepare good teachers, uh, you automatically, the, this good teacher will, will do something. Teacher teach by herself or himself. And let's be honest, uh, teachers in general in former Soviet system were reasonably good. Of course, they were, everybody can say, oh, no, 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 no. I remember my teacher, she was terrible. Uh, it happens. But in general, for many reasons, <laughs> uh, people went into this profession and brought some standards. Uh, I had an experience many, many years ago, I had an experience uh, given a lecture to teachers in the city Siktivkar in Komi Republic, it's uh, north uh, east. And I need to say, group of teachers was absolutely fantastic. And clear answer. Uh, it's a place around which uh, it's a kind of center of Gulag system. A lot of prisons, <laughs> camps, and so on there. And when people left camps, and but they were still in exile, they could not go to Moscow, St. Petersburg, Kiev, whatever. <laughs> they st stayed there. What kind of work they were could find? The dream work the best work was, of course, to become a teacher. You'll say, wait, it was, it was in the 50s. Okay, well, honestly, not only in the 50s, but later, uh, we know some people who was there uh, in exile or prison or whatever, but of course, mainly more people were there. But look, they created some standards. And people who later worked there, I don't know how it is now, but for many years, there were some standards. That, what does it mean, teaching mathematics? Very high standard. What is going on now? Again, the process is controversial. And in many situations, of course, you can't destroy very quickly. But uh, simultaneously, many things worked against this tradition, which I described economical. Uh, it's a mother and issues of prestige, but also, of course, uh, countries, almost all European countries, uh, moved into some changes 
uh, in organization of teacher education. And very many people are very negative about these changes because changing to, let's say, more general system of teacher education and ending, the idea is great, let's teach people more general things, which is in general fine, but uh, you need also to prepare them for their specific work. And so we have, we tried in the book not to judge, not to say good, bad, but rather introduce and show what is happening. And uh, so many people were very critical about uh, these changes. Uh, but important thing which we need to say, although there are very many negative uh, opinions about things happening in basically all countries, in Russia, Ukraine, Poland, Hungary, but still there are very many things which are alive and working and uh, can hopefully continue to work. Uh, the processes, it's one sociological thing, that there was a process of reforms in early 90s, and then it's often went back. Uh, it's very clear in Russia, of course, but not only in Russia, in Hungary, for instance, it also looks like uh, the uh, changes going back. Uh, but still, there are many things which uh, are still alive and uh, can, uh, can be uh, used in the future. I would say that I said at the very beginning about this conservative ideal. Let's do not change anything. Let's stay with how it was. <laughs> well, reality is that it's anyway not possible. And uh, you see this beautiful idea Let's use a textbook of Kiselev. There was a famous book of Kiselev, which my grandfather used, which as a student my father used, and myself. Let's use Kiselev, and that would be great. No, if you give Kiselev the textbook today, kids very often simply will not understand uh, what is written there for many reasons. Uh, and so changes had to be done. The problem is how to arrange uh, changes and how to do them. And what we did in our book, we tried at least to uh, start the discussion of these things, collect data and document what so far was happening. And I would be very happy if we managed to do it. I think I did, as a good teacher, 45 minutes, look, like a lesson. You see, I uh, would say that there are many things which, uh, for me, uh, were, I didn't realize them so clearly. So, you see, I would uh, expect some things, and you see, I'm uh, somewhat connected and doing research about uh, Russia, first of all. Uh, so, but you see, I was uh, very interested to find some very similar processes uh, that uh, you see how things are, uh, you see, similar in, um, say, in Ukraine and Russia. And looks like, looks like they, uh, in some situations, should be different. Uh, but no, because people are uh, going, it's, it's the same situation, and they are looking for um, some solution, and in some way they are coming to the same thing. And the thing which was another interesting thing, that uh, things which I found to be different. And you see some of my authors Right, oh, so terrible, we did at least like that, then like that, then again we changed. Such an unstable situation. Every ministry brings something new. Guys, that's good. I, I looked at this thinking, look, it's good, because that's called human life. Of course, new people are bringing something. And situation when 
in some countries, let's not show, right? Uh, when we just had our plan and we're doing this without any attention to reality, we just go. We are constructing stable. We are supporting stability. That's we don't care at all about what is happening. And yes, I was very happy to discover that in some places it's not like that, that people try to catch the reality. Sometimes not, not right. I disagree. But they at least trying to do something, to react to some reality. And that's, you see, in education, it's, education is a very special thing. If you are, I don't know, producing computers, if you are doing it poorly, it will be discovered very soon. They do not work. People do not buy. You go out of business. In education, the thing that you did something wrong is discovered not immediately. So you need to wait until, oh dear, yes, something is going wrong. So when people are ready to react to this, and yes, in some places, in the same Ukraine, in uh, Poland, in some other places, I see this uh, ability somehow react. And that's uh, officially react. People are reacting everywhere. People are not quiet. But uh, officially react, I think it's a positive thing, yes. You, you see, first, there where it's speaking about previous period, first, it was a bit different in all countries. And uh, say, Soviet Union clearly was more closed than Poland. Of course, Poland had much more connections and uh, you see there was an old an old joke that hungarian are saying that in all our socialist camp our barack is the most free most happy probably i was not absolutely clear with the barack uh, barack has um, the building so the word camp the word camp has two meaning socialist camp and camp like a prison, so so that their place was the most uh, enjoyed them more freedom than anybody else. So so it was different, but you see, of course, everywhere was where, well in many places there were some traditions. Say in Poland or Hungary, they had fantastic traditions in mathematics education. Uh, Hungarian mathematics education, you see. Uh, People are counting how many uh, talented, gifted, famous mathematicians per thousand people. And it looks like Hungary is the world champion in this way because there were very many uh, famous mathematicians. Uh, produced by the system of education, of course. Uh, so I would say that in general, <laughs> Soviet system, Soviet mathematical system, uh, brought some uh, good ideas. Although, of course, generally social, Soviet system in general, not only mathematical, it was a rigid system. And you see, when we're talking about the same textbook of Kiselev, uh, it's, uh, you see, yes, it's a beautiful example of um, international mathematics education culture. Because of course, nobody made secret when he published this before revolution, it was absolutely known by everybody that what he did, he took international understanding, French and German, first of all, and basically used it in Russian conditions. And that's why, and he used all his experience of practical teacher, uh, to, to make it really usable in school. And that was a great success. Uh, so I would say that many things in uh, Soviet Union, uh, you see it happens in history that some great ideas came and in the place of their origin, they already changed. 
but here they survived. And uh, so, yes, there, there were, I, in general, I would say that if you try to distinguish simply mathematical things, I think that exchange of ideas, it was a good thing uh, in taking things from, from Soviet Union. While, of course, the general Soviet system, the system that uh, you see, uh, you don't go, no step to the left, no step to the right, uh, these things, which also to some extent was brought to these places, it was a wrong thing. My mentor, when I worked in school, I had a fantastic teacher who was kind of my mentor. Uh, he was already pretty old. He was of the age which I am now. And he told me how one day they changed ministry, officially changed in Soviet Union, the collection of problems of Larichev. There was a great collection of problems and made a simplified version. And some teacher was discovered to still use old variant, more challenging. And she was reprimanded by the ministry, not by her supervisors, not by her principal, but from the very top. No! Once we said to do this, you do this. Uh, ranking, first of all, because you see, you cannot uh, fairly compare Hungary with Russia. It's just like people today, I don't know how popular it is in Canada, but in the United States, people love to compare United States with Singapore. Look, United States, Singapore, how can you compare them? It's another story. So in Hungary, <laughs> uh, what we can say, yes, they had beautiful system and uh, many, many great mathematicians were developed in this system. By the way, the story is, that's how it's originated. They got a clever minister of education. And this clever minister, before yet, before everything, before World War One, <laughs> and they created some good schools. And when you mention Hungarian mathematicians, they're typically from these schools. And there was a great tradition, and that's that's very important. Uh, but of course, you see, if you just compare number of, I don't know, research mathematicians. Obviously, in Russia, it's many, many times more than in Hungary. But, of course, a lot of ideas uh, came, uh, yes, from Hungary. Some ideas of mm, the teaching uh, came from Hungary. Uh, you see, I generally think <coughs> that in Soviet Union, they created these schools with an advanced course of study in mathematics. <laughs> and uh, these schools obviously were uh, the leaders. Uh, they were in um, schools, boarding schools, which were created in Moscow, in Novosibirsk, in Kiev, I believe and uh, in some other places, then it became more. There were boarding, so there were day schools. Uh, say, just coincidentally, I just uh, was reading yesterday memoirs and collections of stories about famous <coughs> second school in Moscow. It's very famous school, and uh, yes, it was very important. There were very important schools, uh, other St. St. Petersburg, school number 13, school uh, 239. Uh, by the way, I have forgotten speaking about boarding school, of course, in St. Petersburg, also there was boarding school. There were uh, very good mathematical schools in um, some large Ukrainian, uh, cities and so on, and this, uh, these schools, uh, and this tradition is still alive. I can find books published by the authors, uh, by teachers of these schools. Uh, and I would say, yes, these schools, of course, represented the best what was in uh, Russian mathematics education tradition. Uh, simultaneously, in Soviet Union, at least, there was at least there was an attempt 
to provide some basic good education for everybody, not only for the strong person interested for mathematics, but for everybody. Was it always successful? Clearly not. Uh, clearly not. Uh, I'm not sure to what extent it can be. You see, uh, Soviet Union, when you read some documents uh, about number of failures, you find that typically number of failures was 20% in high school. Then it was in uh, 50s. Then, say, in 80s, 70s, beautifully, it became less than a half of a percent. How can you do these things? Well, only by cheating and lying. It's not that education improved. It became that teachers were not in good Brezhnev's time. That teachers were not basically allowed to, to give bad grades. How it is now? Uh, well, I'm afraid, as I said, that very many people do not receive good education in mathematics. And that's probably my major concern, uh, because not about, because even, even the highest level, you cannot support for a long time if you destroy, let's say, this foundation. Uh, so from this point of view, I would say uh, situation, I'm afraid uh, I'm not quite. Uh, you want, you asked a very broad question, what are, major achievements in mathematics, uh, you see uh, uh, it's very, look, uh, <coughs> there are very many achievements uh, in general. Yeah, and look, you see uh, uh, the fact that we are talking now uh, through Skype, uh, there is a lot of mathematics there. And you see one, my friend, uh, from Moscow likes to tell, I'm uh, doing probably not the best things telling his story, but he has a beautiful story how one day he was, it's not the major achievement, but just an example. <laughs> one day uh, he was going abroad and he uh, had with himself a lighter, he's smoking. Uh, System said, no, you cannot take it with you. It's not permitted. Oh, okay, okay. He knows how to do these things. He placed the lighter in something, closed it, put it back, and went again. No, system caught him. So he had to throw it away. Very sad. Half of a year later, in his institution, at his seminar, <laughs> some guy was talking about applications and told that they improved the system of checking luggage. And in doing this, as my friend discovered, they used functions and representations of functions, so mathematical apparatus, which he developed. So he suddenly learned that he lost his favorite lighter because he introduced some new piece of mathematics. You see, today, today, uh, a lot of stuff is there, but I would say that it's about mathematics. If you say what are major results in mathematics education, I would say that uh, probably the major result uh, is not recent result, but with all my really very negative feelings about uh, <laughs> Soviet Union, but uh, the result that basically, okay, 80%, not 100, 70%, but 70% of students learned and mastered pretty sophisticated course of geometry, and algebra as it was basically developed for elite institutions. So what was proved <laughs> to the extent to which you can prove something historically, that it's not true that only very few people can study 
these sophisticated mathematics of reasoning, proven, thinking, and so on. No, basically, let's say everybody can do. You just need to do it. You just need to teach. And when I say everybody, of course, you always can find somebody who for this or that reason, it does not work. But generally, our expectation is that, yes, we can and should teach these sophisticated things. And when we teach this thing, we receive generations <laughs> of mathematical people, of scholars, of researchers, of engineers, and so on and so forth. Fantastic question. Fantastic question. First, <coughs> That's a very interesting thing, and that's a huge difference between, say, Russia, not Soviet Union, Russian Empire, and uh, Europe, and uh, other East parts of Europe, I mean, and, say, United States. In Russia, mathematics education came from the very beginning for some specific military purposes. Not that it was not absolutely like that other way, in other countries. In France, of course, military schools were centers of mathematics education. It's everywhere. <coughs> uh, well, Navy schools. But uh, in Russia, more emphasis was placed on this. And mathematics was deeply respected from this way. I never can, I will give an example. Uh, that in some Russian pre-revolutionary uh, Navy schools, uh, if students, military schools, if <coughs> students failed to do home assignments in languages, in humanities, he was punished. No dinner for this person. But if the guy failed to do something in mathematics, or in military subjects, like marching or shooting or whatever, or fortification, then he received corporal punishment, much more severe. So mathematics was, in, in not, don't take me wrong, I am not in support of corporal punishments as well as uh, not given dinner. But mathematics automatically was counted higher than something else. That, I'm not saying that it's good, I'm saying that's how it was. In, say, in Germany, it was opposite. But, and in Soviet Union, of course, when you think why they did not destroy mathematics, like, for example, they destroyed biology. Look, Soviet Union has fantastic biology, fantastic genetics. But, uh, they destroyed, they uh, arrested leaders, they uh, basically killed basically Vavilov, the greatest scholar, they uh, closed the institutes for genetics, and so on and so forth. Why did not they make it for <laughs> mathematics? And the answer is clear. There are many stories, many evidences when people uh, came to Stalin with similar ideas, let's do. And of course, there were people who wanted to sit in the chairs of the leaders. Let us be the leaders. And Comrade Stalin asked them a question, and are you able, guys, to do a bomb, nuclear bomb? No, then go away. So yes, these things were correct. Now, what is going now? The beginning, if you hear, is a process. Of course, in 90s, the rhetoric was uh, much more peaceful that mathematics, we need mathematics for development. But look, we need uh, whatever other languages for development too. And uh, many people said, no, now we don't need mathematics. We will do it. Well, almost no mathematics. And uh, their prestige of mathematics because of these things in some situations went down. Now, of course, rhetoric is different and mathematics in Russia returns its position. And I believe 
uh, returns in rhetoric again. In reality, it's the most sophisticated thing. And I believe very often just because it's it's again treated as uh, how else will will do our famous missiles. We're doing them because we have great mathematics. Uh, I'm afraid that in your, I'll say, Poland, Hungary, uh, change uh, in understanding uh, what we need uh, for uh, students, for, for the country, uh, was not always beneficial for position of mathematics. My colleague Gerd Schubring, whom I cited, whom I mentioned already, likes to cite a formula, a sentence, which existed in 18th century uh, Germany in schools. They said, mathematicus non est collega which means that teacher of mathematics is not a real colleague, meaning that us teachers of humanities are much better, more prestige than teacher of mathematics. Uh, in Russia, it wasn't like that. In Russia, probably on the contrary. Again, I do not, <laughs> I generally believe all, all teachers should enjoy prestige, whether they are teaching English, Russian, mathematics, biology. Uh, so I'm not in support of saying who is the best, who is the most important. Uh, but it's as historians we need to understand that yes, they are different traditions. Okay, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Yeah, very good. Yeah.